Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hi, I'm Cray. Welcome to today's webinar covering what's new in HECRAS 6.0, the beta version. I am absolutely stoked to be uh, hosting this webinar today together with the HECRAS development team. We've got lead developer Gary Brunner and the lead uh, developer of RAS Mapper, Cam Ackerman, on with us today. I do want to highlight you, all the attendees out there. Look at this. Um, from over 100 countries, 2,000 registrants, the interest in HECRAS has been growing tremendously uh, since the first webinar we did on HECRAS through the Australian Water School a couple of years ago. It's amazing to see what's happened. And some of these uh, new features are things that we've been anticipating for quite a while. And we are excited to be highlighting these for you today. So if we can get everybody to turn their cameras on, I wanted to introduce uh, to you Gary and Cam, along with Mark and Chris. If you've attended these webinars in the past, you may have seen some of these faces before. Uh, but this is the first time we've got Gary and Cam on. So Chris and Mark have helped host some of these before for us through the Australian Water School, but we are absolutely thrilled to have Gary and, and Cam on. So before we introduce everybody, just uh, wanted to have a look at the poll results that you filled out. So thanks for filling those out for us. That helps us see how to lead into the, the presentation today and where everybody's coming from. I do see, as always, private commercial consulting being the one that, uh, that gets the most use. Now look at this experience with Hector as more than five years category has the most use. And uh, so far, less than half have downloaded 6.0. So get on that. Um, let's let's get that uh, to over half. Now, uh, here is uh, where we get to see um, who's been at this for a long time. Um, have you used HEC2? And we didn't call it heck in the day. It was HEC. Uh, any surprises there, guys? Let's, uh, you know, let's just uh, have some discussion back and forth. Cam, Gary, Chris, and Mark. Uh, I assume all of us would have answered the question yes so we are in the minority uh <laughs> any, right. any comments on that <laughs> it is surprising to me to even see 25 percent people have used tech too so um there's a lot of us senior people online right now that's great yes <laughs> good so I want to leave as much time as possible for the presentation. I don't want to take up too much time um, up front, but what's going to happen here is Gary is going to do a presentation on the, the new features. Then Cam's going to take over and talk about RAS Mapper specifically and the new tools, awesome new tools that are available there. Now, Chris and Mark will be in the background answering your questions on the Q&A line. So uh, the whole time, this is going to be interactive. And then we'll all come back on at the end and, uh, and answer some of these questions live. One thing that we're going to point out, the RAS Solution uh, YouTube page, which uh, Chris will put a link up to in, in the chat line, uh, we've got three hours with Gary, including some guitar solos, awesome stuff that you want to see uh, where we can cover these things in more detail there. Um, and so some of the questions that you may have and some of the things that we only touch on briefly will be covered in more detail and in a, um, a live demo setting there. So um, do check that out. And I've noticed that we are at 4,900 and something subscribers. So subscribe to that one. And if you are the 5,000th subscriber, there's a special gift coming your way. So uh, take a screenshot shot if you're the one at 4999 and you become the 5,000th subscriber uh, maybe we'll bring you on to the vodcast um, uh, to the full momentum vodcast to uh, give you a little congratulations and pass along some promotional gifts so do do get over onto that one and subscribe um, I most of our videos on there um, you know it takes takes us a while to to hit um, 20,000 views but YouTube sends me these notices with the channel stats and within a couple of days of when Gary came on we had 20,000 views um, I was like, wow, this is really big. And then I realized the 20,000 views, yeah, it was really big, you know, maybe a couple thousand, but the 20,000 views were, Chris, your, your shot of the elk. So before we uh, sign you <laughs> off, uh, maybe just describe what happened with the elk real quick. I have no, I had no idea how popular elk running on a beach would be, but uh, apparently that's a very fun thing to look at. So uh, yeah, it just happened to be uh, on a beach during a particularly very high king tide. And this herd of elk just ran on. Of course, I was there to view all of the uh, the hydraulics of, of the uh, the surge coming in and out. Uh, and then this uh, herd of elk ran out in front of me and uh, almost got killed by it. Fortunately, they all survived. But uh, it's a really cool video. But I personally think the interview with Gary is way cooler. So let's get some more <laughs> views on that and uh, and stop watching the elk, if you will. Exactly. All right. <laughs> 
Sounds good. We'll hit Raz Mapper then, um, and we'll we'll go in in reverse order. All there right. We go. Okay, we can see that. So I'm going to turn my video off. Uh, the other presenters again will be in the background answering your questions the whole time. So over to you, Cam. All right. Well, um, Gary and I are excited to be here. Looks like Gary's machine's a little more excited than I am. And as with most things, uh, we have to save the best for last. So Gary's Gary's going to have that opportunity to close. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about HC RAS 6 and some of the new things you can expect to benefit from from RAS, RAS Mapper. So just three small categories we're going to talk about today. Uh, the first one will be some uh, general editing tools. We'll get into uh, terrain modification tools. And then we'll talk about what we're calling the raster calculator uh, near the end of the presentation. Before I really get going, hopefully my buddies are out there watching right now. Uh, I wanted to make sure that everyone understands that the RAS team, while we're a, we're a pretty small group of individuals working on a pretty uh, special piece of software, uh, these two gentlemen, Alex Kennedy and Anton uh, Rodersiren, are two, two of the key uh, players in the RAS mapper de development. So I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that uh, even though Gary and I might be doing the speaking, there's a lot of other people in the background uh, helping make the project go. So the first set of things we're going to talk about are just general editing tools that we've added to HC RAS. As RAS, has, RAS Mapper has grown, we've tried to make the interface provide more in interactive features. One thing we've changed is we're still, the layers that you're working on in RAS Mapper, the selection of the layer you're working on is a key component. So we really want to highlight what layer is being worked on. So we're going to be highlighting over in the table of contents a little bit better. Uh, so you know which layer you're actually working on. I myself as a power user, I still end up trying to draw a cross section on the river center line every time I go to edit, edit my data set. So um, just something else to give back to the users. You'll also see in the new layer list, the layers here that are in gray, we're trying to identify to users that are trying to review models, where do I need to go look for data? So nodes that are in black indicate that data exists. Nodes that are in gray indicate uh, they're available for editing, but there may not be any data there or there is no data there. We've also tried to uh, instill some data management over in RAS Mapper to allow you to not only edit your data, save it as another uh, data set so you can make a, a slight modification, uh, delete an old geometry data set, or create a new uh, geometry directly from RAS Mapper. So there's a little bit less going back and forth between the geometric data uh, editor and RAS Mapper. And then the third bullet I've got here, and probably the most important, is the ability to auto update features. Uh, so when you're editing in RAS, when you are creating a new feature in RAS Mapper, every time you move that new feature, it gets updated with elevation data, bank stations, reach links, whatever, whatever data you have available. Once you've saved that data, we treat that as a existing data set and the data will not update. So if you like your river stations, but you just want to modify your cross section, uh, coming in here to what you want to update or what you do not want to update. In this case, uncheck the river stations checkbox. Those river stations will be fixed and uh, you won't have any data bus with your flow data. So again, if you're trying to make sure your data does not update, you'll want to come in uh, to the geometry properties and select the data that you wish to update and the data that you do not. We've added uh, all new structure capability. So any layers that you need in RAS, we now have the capability to lay them out geospatially. Specifically, the layers I've got here on this slide, we're talking about hydraulic structures such as bridges, inline structures, lateral structures, and the SA2D connection. Uh, pumps are also geospatial. So not only are you gonna define uh, an actual feature, which is listed on the left, you'll also be able to define how that feature is going to interact with RAS. So if I have a bridge, does it have a culvert barrel? If I have an inline structure, does it have a gate and a culvert? And so on. So each one of our connections is now geospatial, including our pumps. So what does this look like? Uh, this is a real quick and dirty uh, screenshot. You can see here, I've got a SA2D connector. I've got a bridge uh, across my main river here. Um, they're all now geospatial, so you can lay out where they exist in your model. You can then add, here you can see culverts and gates shown in the white block. And you can see they can either connect 
from cell to cell, or they can connect from one cell, which might be on the upstream of a structure, farther downstream, 10 cells below, to another 2D cell. We can do the same thing with pump stations. Here you can see a nice pump station icon where you can go from cell to cell, you can go out of a system, or as shown in the most downstream part here, we're going from a 2D area to a storage area. Each of those geospatial structures, whether it be a culvert barrel um, or a pump, will come up with a minimalized editor where you can define um, geospatial type of data. Um, but to complete the data, you will still need to do so from the geometric data editor um, in RAS. We have changed the way we work with um, other layers, our base data layers, uh, which we're calling classification layers. These classification layers are a superset for Manning's n values, percent impervious, and infiltration data. So uh, we're still going to have the same import where you can go out and grab um, a land use, land cover data set um, that's a TIFF and bring that into RAS. Uh, here you can see for, for uh, the Bald Eagle Creek data set in the United States, we have a land use, land cover data set for Bald Eagle. Um, but we've now added the capability where we can add editing features directly on top of that raster. So once you've added a raster data set in RAS, you can then uh, use classification polygons to reclassify the underlying data. This is very similar to how we're doing the override regions as far as bringing in a data set and overriding. However, we've made this consistent along all of the, um, all the raster data uh, that we support. Once you have in import the data set and created your classification data, you'll then have access to it through a table that'll be easily accessible uh, to copy and paste and save your changes uh, for later. Here you can see we have columns for Manning's N and percent impervious shown for the same land use land cover data set. When it comes to uh, inundation mapping, uh, oftentimes we find there, there are holes or gaps in our data due to how we have laid out our cross sections um, or how we've laid out in this case, the combination of cross sections with the 2D area. You can see that there's a gap separating um, along a levee that's separating our main 1D model from our overflow 2D model. In this case, uh, while the inundation mapping might not uh, look so bad when you're zoomed out, as an engineer, you know it's not right. So we've added the capability to make an adjustment without having to redo your hydraulics model. So we've added the capability to edit edge lines that are associated with the edge of the cross section. So to do so, you just start editing the edge lines and then you can digitize, uh, digitize that bound, what we used to call a bounding polygon. When you finish editing, RAS will complete that data set and make sure that it's snapped to the ends of each of the cross sections so you have a continuous data set. At that point then, uh, you might have this done for one geometry, but maybe you have 10 other geometries where you don't want to have to replicate the same work. While we don't have editing capabilities in the results data file, and for good reason, we don't want you modifying your results, we do allow you to import the edge lines uh, based on another geometry. So you can import those edge lines across multiple geometries, and here you'll see we have continuous mapping in the floodplain. We've added the capability uh, for profile lines. Profile lines, we had a first cut at it. Now they are a true geospatial feature that you can, uh, that creates a shapefile that you can either copy and paste into, import from shapefile, or as you create them, they're stored. We've added uh, additional feature for active features. Any layer in the tree, you'll be able to select that uh, feature and then you'll have options for that feature. In this case, we're looking at cross sections where we'll have the ability to plot the profile or plot results directly for that cross section. As well, we've added a layer values watch list where you can add uh, layers to this list. Mostly we're gonna be wanting to add raster data. We can then organize and prioritize this raster data. And then as we map, uh, move our cursor over the the result maps, you'll be able to get results. So here you can see velocity uh, results for three different runs and compare them um, 
for your different plans. Now let's talk about terrain modifications. Uh, as you know, all good, all good river hydraulics models start with a great terrain model. But often we don't start with a great, great terrain model just because of the uh, either the data that's available to us in the system. So oftentimes we as hydraulic engineers need to modify that terrain model. We're not gonna talk about it today, but uh, there is a way to do terrain replacement using cross sections if you need detailed information for the channel or other ways. But the new option that we've added are vector overrides for the terrain layer. These vector overrides are grouped into three main categories, simple shapes, lines, and polygons. These uh, vector overrides uh, are going to be added to a particular terrain model, but you can copy these terrain modifications between terrain layers, or you can copy a modification, say you have a, a levy alignment from a, a shape file or somebody else's work. So you can either import that from a shape file or copy and paste once you've brought it into RAS. So they work with all the existing editing tools. These modifications we're calling vector modifications because they are they are truly vector adds that end up triangulating above the raster and then are used as the first priority cut when extracting information. These modifications are used for both visualization and for all our computations. And the real benefit is we can reuse these vector features in other layers. So let's look at how we would do this. Uh, we realize that adding vector mods to a single train uh, layer, once people got their hands on it, they were gonna start doing it over and over and over again. So the first thing that we added, uh, thanks a lot to Mr. Alex Kennedy, was he's like, hey, we, we gotta clone this, these terrain data. So the first step in doing this is you can clone your terrain model, which doesn't copy all of the terrain data, which could be gigabytes and gigabytes. It just uh, creates a pointer to that file and then we store the vector additions in that separate file, but it's still working off of the base data. It's easy to do. We just right click on the train model and ask to cl clone the model. Once you've cloned your model, then you can go in and you can add channel modifications. So uh, this should be highlighted right here, but it should say add new uh, modification layer. And when you add the new modification layer, you choose whether you want to use our simple shapes, our lines, or our polygons. Simple shapes would be things like circles, rectangles, triangles. So simple piers, uh, maybe a building that was in the floodplain. And then we have a more advanced option called elongated piers. And the elongated piers, I'll show you what that looks like in a bit, but that allows you to have different shapes to the nose. If you're choosing the line option, you can use high ground for a levee, or you can use channel. Uh, for a river channel. And then we have more complex features, uh, which we, we're calling polygons, which are gonna allow you to choose a multi-point shape as shown here in this pond. Here's an example of a simple shape used for a pier where we've simply added a circular pier in the channel. We've got four piers that are added. Um, and as you can see over in the tree on the left, we have a terrain layer with a modifications layer, and here we've chosen to add piers. In this example, I've got a more complex pier where I've got a triangular nose on a uh, triangular nose on one side of the pier. It's a long pier, and then on the uh, leeward side, I've got a rounded nose. So those are both options available to you uh, through a simple editor, where you simply choose a simple shape elevation, uh, pier width, and then define what you want the noses to look like, and whether you'd like to use a a, a long pier or just a rounded one. For high ground, uh, we start to get a little more complicated. Here we've got a simple line, which we're gonna use to represent our levy. Once we've added that levy, then we can define a template, in this case, a top width, side slopes, and extents for that shape. That shape will follow the, the levy alignment based on the river stationing, or the, uh, excuse me, the levy stationing that we've specified. Here we have a levee that goes from 943 feet in elevation down to 941. You might be asking, 
what if I don't want to digitize that by hand? How do I get it in? We have an importer. It will import both 2D and 3D shapefiles. Well, maybe you don't like uh, the elevations that are provided by your terrain model or some alignment you have received. We also have added the capability to add control points to that object. So you can go in and uh, click along the line. Here you can see I'm adding a point. It's in magenta or in green. And when we add a point, an interface will come up allowing you to use an override elevation along that alignment. Once elevation control points are added, uh, those control points will be shown in gray in your station elevation table. And then your uh, user specified overrides uh, within the table, you can just, those are in white and those can be added or deleted at your leisure. Uh, for those of you who are already using RAS, uh, the, the first beta has a little uh, bug in it with simple shapes, surprisingly. Uh, so here's a little example where we've added five peers and uh, the fix went in yesterday. So we've got that fixed. So those of you who have run into that bug, uh, it's now fixed. Here you can see we've got five piers um, at the same elevation of 955 along the, the channel. And based on what we're seeing, we're seeing this is what the old cross section looks like, the green. And the brown line is what we're going to get if we were to extract the information based on those peers. All right, the last thing I have to share with you uh, this evening or this morning, depending on where you're from, is the raster calculator. Um, the raster calculator is intended to allow us to perform mathematical and logical operations on HEC RAS spatial results. So right now it works on results that are generated from RAS. We're calling these calculated layers and they can use existing results and terrain layers at the moment. The way we're doing this is allowing you to specify user-defined variables. So what type of plan, what plan are you using? Plan one, what type of map are you looking at? Maybe it's depths, water surfaces, velocities. Uh, do you want that uh, layer to animate or do you want it to be static? I only wanna look at it for the max profile or profile one. Once you've generated a calculation, it's uh, generated through a scripting mode and that script can be saved uh, to disk and then loaded later or shared with friends. All right, so what does that look like? Well, simply uh, RAS needed a good way to compare water surfaces. So here's an example of comparing plan one to plan two, where I'm just comparing water surface elevations. And as you can see from the legend uh, for this example, uh, one of the water surfaces was about a foot difference around this levee breach location and uh, about two tenths of a foot different through a, a, a more steep section in the river based on the grid cell size. How do we do this? To generate um, a layer, we come into the raster calculator and we define what script we might want to use. So in this case, we've got three scripts that are shipping with RAS to give you a blueprint for creating your own. So we can compare water surfaces. We're going to choose that one as the option we'd like to look at. And it's going to generate a script for us that we can then modify. We can go in and we can modify water surface, uh, we can modify variables, or we can modify how they're being used within the code. If we want to do a user defined, we have a short little demonstration here where we're going to do a user defined uh, script where we're going to compare velocities. So we're going to go in and we're going to add a variable. It's going to come up with a plan name, a map type, and an animation behavior. You choose which ones you'd like, set a variable name, say add variable, and it will start generating code for you. So it starts to show you the blueprint for what you need to do. We're going to add a second variable. In this case, it's going to be a second plan. We're going to call it V2, and we're going to add that variable. At that case, in that, uh, once you've added your second variable, the code um, will start adding some stub outs for important pieces of information. But you as a user will need to go in and say, OK, do I want to evaluate cells that don't have any data? In this case, you don't. If my velocity doesn't have any data, then what should my velocity be considered? Is it no data or is it zero? 
So simple uh, programming checks that you need to add. The goal with these scripts are to have a good user community where we start to uh, see dozens of scripts being generated that people tend to use all the time. We can ship those with RAS and they'll be generated automatically for you. The last little bit here is once we've got that layer exported, or uh, excuse me, once we've got that layer generated, we're often gonna wanna share that with our friends and family or maybe our, co our coworker. Uh, in this case, we've got our velocity comparison. We wanna push that down the road uh, for engineering to, to look at. So uh, we've added the capability to export those to a raster that can be used within a GIS of your choosing or uh, within another RAS project. Lastly, before we finalize, we've also added RAS online documentation. Um, so if you go to hec.usace.army.mil slash confluence slash RAS docs, it'll take you to the uh, user's manuals that we have online. This documentation will be growing um, as we have more and more finished. And uh, right now, the best thing for you to know about are known issues. If you're wondering if you're having that issue, uh, go to the known issues page and we will be uh, updating those as bugs come in and we are fixing them. So at this point, I'll allow, I'd like to say thank you for your time. Uh, I don't know if we have time for a question, but if not, I will turn it over to Gary. Yeah, I think what we'll do here real quick is just see which uh, questions have been promoted the most while um, if you stop sharing yours, Gary, if you can try sharing your screen, make sure that's working. Um, but while while we're talking here, I'm just looking at the Q&A line. Thanks for all those questions coming in. Awesome, Gary, this is going to work. So uh, we're good. Uh, but as the questions have come in, um, keep them coming. Um, we've got uh, the experts on the line, Chris and Mark uh, from HDR and from Kleinschmidt um, answering our questions here live as you put, type them in. Um, uh, they've been frantically uh, putting their responses in. Uh, the, the ones that have come out on top are uh, about the looks looks like with the most promotes and uh, and an advancement up there with the most thumbs up um, are the ones about uh, GPU and uh, and Mac versions. So just go ahead and have a look at those answers um, if you're interested in that. Um, Chris and Mark, before we turn over to Gary, anything that jumps out at you that uh, that you wanted to highlight from the Q and A that you've hit so far? Wow, there was so much that was coming in. I, I was having a very tough time keeping up with everybody. So I apologize. Um, we couldn't get everything answered here. But uh, a lot of the questions I think are going to be answered in Gary's segment coming up. So stay tuned for that. Um, there were quite a few questions on the raster calculator and uh, terrain manipulation. Um, but I, I think that there's not really one that stood out. There's just a lot of them in there. I don't know if this is something we can work on later to, to <laughs> yeah. cover. But uh, now what we'll cover, we'll cover those in detail in the Q and A. And it just just keep in mind that on the RAS Solution um, uh, YouTube channel, we do have tutorial videos on each of these things, uh, including the raster calculator, including terrain modifications. Um, so that that'll be available to you there. All right. Well, um, this is the the prime time show here. Um, so Gary, thanks. We can see your screen. Uh, the rest of us will tune out um, and keep frantically answering questions. Okay. Uh, we'll all come back on when you're done. So over over to you. All right. Before we get too far in, I'd just like to mention that Ken mentioned a couple of the RAS team members, but there's actually eight of us on the RAS team. Myself, uh, Mark Jensen, Steve Piper, and Cameron, who you know, Stanford Gibson, Alex Kennedy, Alex Sanchez, and Anton Rodder Sierra. And these are kind of their main focuses of what they're in charge of on the team. What am I going to cover today? Well, I'm going to cover um, spatial precipitation and infiltration. We're going to talk about bridge hydraulics and 2D flow areas. We're going to talk about wind forces. Um, we also have a new 1D finite volume solver. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We've added a third equation solver for 2D, which we'll talk a little bit about that and why. Uh, pump stations inside 2D flow areas. Computational speed improvements for 2D. And then uh, briefly, a video on the 3D visualization tool. So let's jump right in. Um, spatial precip. So we now have the ability to do both gridded and point gauge data. And if you're doing gridded, obviously you get a spatial grid. And we have three formats we can accept for gridded data. Um, our HEC has its own database called HEC DSS, and we store grids in that database. And we have a program called HEC MetView, which is also a free program that can ingest gridded data and write it to HEC DSS. So you might wanna download MetView uh, if you're gonna work with gridded data. 
The other two formats we have are, are um, GRIB and NetCDF, which are, are produced in the states here by the National Weather Service. Um, if you don't have good data, we also allow point gauge data. And the, the main reason for adding point gauge data is that maybe you want to look at a historic event where you didn't have good data. So you can add point gauges, and there's different ways to get that data in there, uh, HCDSS or just into tables. But if you put in point gauges, it still creates a grid by interpolating those data from those point gauges to the cell level. So in the unsteady flow data boundary conditions editor, there's a new tab. Well, there's a couple of new tabs, but there's a new tab called meteorologic data. And that's where you're going to go to enter this spatial precipitation data. So right away, there's a thing that says precipitation and evapotranspiration. You're going to hit drop down and hit enabled. When you do that, the window will morph and you'll get some more information. And you'll see this meteorologic variables in this precipitation area. And then you can pick the mode. Is it going to be gridded or point gauge? Or you can just enter a constant if you want. Once you say, let's say in this example, gridded, then you got to pick the source. Is it going to come from DSS or is it going to be one of these other raster files? Um, so right now we're, we're kind of limited on different formats we can ingest, but that's probably going to grow over time as people present to us formats they'd like to be able to ingest as gridded data for rainfall. Um, for point gauge data, you've got to first create uh, point gauge stations. So if you're going to do point gauge data, you create these stations first. And here I got um, some bunch of stations created. And in addition to that, you have to select how you want to interpolate. So we've got a bunch of different interpolation methods. Um, but the reality of it is point gauge data is just not very good spatial information, which is why we would prefer to use grids. But and any kind of interpolation method for point gauge data is not going to be great because it's really trying to interpolate only based on the few points that you have. And it really doesn't know what's happening in between. But we've got a bunch of different methods. We'll talk about some of them here in a second. Here's an example um, where I had a bunch of point gauges. And this is our friend Bald Eagle Creek. But there was only one gauge in Bald Eagle Creek. And then there were some others around it. And this is using the Thiessen polygon interpolation method, which is kind of analogous to hydrology modeling for subbasin areas. And then this is like inverse distance squared interpolation method. And you can see the different colors and how that works out. And then this is inverse distance squared, but what's called triangulation limited, meaning you triangulate all the gauges, then you only interpolate based on the three nearest gauges to where you're at, based on that triangle. Another cool method that we've added is called peak preservation method. And what's nice about this method is that most of the interpolation methods, if the rain event is moving and the timing is different at the gauges, so if you go to interpolate, you kind of lose the peak intensity because of the interpolation. This peak preservation method, what it does is it lines up all the gauges to their center of mass and then it interpolates on the magnitude of the data. And, but spatially, it interpolates the time based on the time that it actually occurred at each gauge. So that's kind of a method that's going to try to preserve those peak intensities so you don't squash the intensity of the rainfall when you're interpolating gauge data, point, gauge point data. And here's just an example of just um, of what you'd end up with. So on the left is the hiatal graph at a point in the watershed. This is just for one cell. On the right, you can plot the results for all the interpolated methods. So here I'm showing the cumulative preset, in this case in inches versus time. And these are just the various interpolation methods of what happened. Uh, the peak preservation method is the one that's the highest and the most intense. And then you can see the others are varied. They all did similar, but there was about an inch difference between the highest and the lowest. Um, you can also, in that MetView program I mentioned earlier, this is an example of doing a gridded probable maximum preset. So on the left, there's a PMP, problem max and precip. And then on the right is just, a, I clicked in the watershed and asked for a, a hydrograph plot at, at a node and then an accumulation of rainfall. And so that MetView program allows you to do probable max and precipitation and then write those grids to DSS. And then RAS can ingest that right, right in directly. As far as infiltration, um, right now we have three infiltration methods, a real simple one called deficit constant, Kind of an intermediate one uh, here in the States from the Soil Conservation Service, SCS curve number method, and then a more physically based one, uh, green and amped. Uh, to drive these methods, you, you need either soils or land cover or both. Um, and each of the methods actually have options to reestablish the initial and loss rate based on dry periods of time. So if you're going to do that, you can either just base it on a time with no rain, or you can actually have a baffle transpiration data that you enter and so forth, especially if you're using like green and amped. 
Here's just an, uh, an animation then of a model that comes, this model comes with the, the software. And so it's, it's a, a grid of precipitation infiltration example. And so if you download a RAS 60 beta, you have this data set, okay? And so here, this is just an animation straight out of RAS Mapper. So right in RAS Mapper, we're animating the precip and you can see what's happening over time. And this is, this is hourly values, okay? Now I'm gonna zoom back into the watershed. The watershed originally started dry on purpose just to show there was nothing there. And then I, I did have an upstream inflow hydrograph at the lower left, but then the rest of it was rainfall. And sometimes to see the, the rainfall, you've got to zoom in further because remember, depending upon the grid cell size, the, once the water hits a cell, it goes to the lowest point in each grid cell size in the 2D area. So that's spatial precipitation and infiltration. Um, if you want to learn more about that, uh, obviously you can read the 2D user's manual, but also on the RAS Solution um, channel, there's a, a YouTube video that we did uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I actually did a, a live demo on how to do the spatial precipitation and infiltration. And there's like 45 minutes just on that. Uh, so if you go to that YouTube video, you can learn a lot more detail about how to do it. Um, also on that same YouTube video, there's a demo on how to do 2D bridges. So we're gonna talk about it in overview right now, but if you want more detail, there's detail on the 2D user's manual, and then there's that video on the RAS Solution channel that uh, Chris Goodell is gonna put a link to in the chat. So 2D bridges in, bridges in 2D flow areas. So before 6.0, we didn't have any bridge capability inside 2D areas. So what people had to do was basically develop a uh, combined 1D and 2D model and put the bridge in the 1D side. But now we have bridge capability in 2D and it, it can do the full suite of bridge hydraulics. So it does low flow, pressure flow, pressure flow and weir flow, including overtopping, and maybe low flow through a bridge and, and overtopping around the sides. So anything you could do in 1D as far as bridge hydraulics, you can do for bridge hydraulics in 2D. Well, why is this important? Well, like I said, the previous version did not have this capability. So people ended up doing combined 1D and 2D models just because they wanted to include bridges because the bridges were important to the computation of the water service for their model. So this led to more kind of 1D, 2D connections that are more complicated, like these lateral structures from 1D to 2D. Could be more time consuming to develop. Some of these connections, depending upon how you put it together, may cause instabilities. Um, the flow transfers were probably less accurate because now you were using instead of the 2D equations to transfer from the channel to the floodplain, you're using a simple maybe weir equation or a stage tra transfer that we have. And, um, and some, sometimes even more computational time required to do that because the 1D, 2D iterations may cause, be causing a lot of iterating back and forth. So the benefits of this new capability are, we don't, you no longer need to do 1D slash 2D modeling, it can just be complete 2D. Um, you can create more DT, detailed 2D models this way with bridges in them and, and channel and so forth. So it's gonna give you greater model flexibility. Um, should be more stable too, because now the transfer of flow from the channel to the floodplain is just the 2D solution, which is very stable. Uh, these flow transfers will be more accurate also. So you won't be using a weird equation, you'll be using the 2D equations to transfer flow from the channel to the overbanks. And potentially it could even be faster depending upon how many cells you use to model the channel. So if you're not doing a super detailed channel model and you're just having a few cells across the channel, uh, this could end up actually being faster because it's not gonna have to iterate between 1D and 2D. So what's the approach? Well, the approach is that we're gonna ha have you lay out a, a bridge center line and some bridge data, but then we're gonna extract four cross sections just, and we're gonna use these cross sections like we do in 1D to pre-process the data into creating a family of curves, a family of headwater, tailwater flow curves, okay? But once we have those curves, those curves will get applied to the faces that are the center line that you drew for the bridge. And what we've done is we've written a special momentum equation that we apply at those bridge faces. And what it does is it, it for a given tailwater and a flow, it can go to the curves and get a headwater. And then that difference between headwater and tailwater, that elevation difference gets equated to a force. And that force basically represents all the friction loss, pressure differential, and convective acceleration forces that occur between the downstream outside cross section and the upstream outside cross section. So we have a special momentum equation where we grab the force from the curves for those portions of the momentum. But in addition to that, there is the, 
Local acceleration term, though, that gets calculated on the fly. They change an acceleration with respect to time that's not pre-processed, okay? So this special momentum equation then gets most of the force from the curves, but compute partially of the force on the fly. And then it distributes that force between the phases, depending upon how much flow is it going through each phase and the conveyance, okay? So the cool thing about this is when it actually solved this bridge, um, it's still solving it in 2D the whole time. It's just capturing and computing the force at these phases based on the curves mostly, and then the local acceleration term. And so it's not a 1D bridge. Ultimately, it's 1D bridge hydraulics computing the forces, but it's still 2D equations solving for the flow going through and across and over the bridge. So here's an example uh, just of a layout. So let's say this is upstream on the left and then we're moving, this is downstream on the right. You just go to your, our friend SA2D area connector and you draw a center line from left to right looking downstream. Once that center line is drawn and you click on that, you bring up the SA2D editor like before. The only thing new is now you just need to go to this structure type and pick bridge. Okay, so there's a new structure type. There's a new the bridge structure type. Once you pick that bridge structure type, this editor morphs into what kind of looks like the 1D bridge editor because you have the deck and roadway editor, pier editor, sloping abutment, bridge modeling approach, and the hydraulic table parameter control. So you go ahead and enter that deck and roadway, pier, abutments, bridge line approach, and H tab, and you'll see your bridge. And once you have all that data completed and you, and you close this out, you'll see what looks like the bridge here. And the bridge is the gray blob, but these red uh, dots are the cross sections that it automatically creates. So it's gonna extract a cross section downstream outside the bridge, then one inside the bridge at the downstream end, one inside the bridge at the upstream end, and one outside the bridge at the upstream end. And those four cross sections and the bridge data are gonna be used to pre-process and develop these bridge curves, which you see here on the lower left, okay? So once the curves are developed, then it still, it just runs normal 2D. And like I said before, these faces, these curves are applied at these centerline faces with a special momentum equation, but the whole thing is still run in 2D. I'm going to do a little example because people are going to say, well, what's the difference between 1D versus 2D? So thinking about that ahead of time, here's a, a single bridge model, and here's the bridge on the right, and here's the curves that get created on the left. I ran this exact same bridge, okay, in 1D, so it's the same exact bridge data, same exact terrain, same end values everywhere also, okay? The only difference is 1D versus 2D and same bridge curves. So here's a little animation, and so on the left is going to be a map showing the the two results in, in as far as uh, velocity is concerned and, and an inundation mapping. And on the right, we're gonna see the profile. This is a profile down the center line of the channel, okay? And the lighter blue one is the 2D result and the darker blue one is the 1D result. So even at low flow, we see that the 2D result is already a little bit higher, even though it has the same exact end values. And that's because that there's many more faces than there are cross sections. So the 2D model is seeing much more of the terrain and it's also seeing, computing the result in two dimensions. Whereas the 1D model only sees the train at the cross sections. And then in between that, everything is, is linearly transitioning. And so the 2D model and 1D model are not gonna give exactly the same answer. Um, and the general tendency is the 2D model will give a higher answer with the same end values because it sees way more terrain, way more wetter perimeter, and way more contractions and expansions than what is seen computationally by the 1D model. So right away, if we were calibrating, we probably would have to adjust the end values between 1D and 2D. So let's go ahead and animate this. So here we go, flow is rising, the water surfaces are rising. You know, the difference between 1D and 2D is getting lower and lower as we get to deeper water, but nothing's hit the bridge cord yet, the low cord of the bridge deck. So watch what happens to the two water surfaces once they start hitting the low cord of the bridge deck. And we're just about there. And 2D just hit it. Now 1D hit it. There they're rising right away. Okay. And now the flow is going even further. So we're going to rise. Now we're going to start to over top. Okay. Now they're both over topping the bridge. And so while there's some differences at the bridge itself, upstream of the bridge, the results are basically the same. They're less than a tenth of a foot different upstream of the bridge. 
And that's because the bridge curves are, for the most part, controlling the upstream water surface. These local differences are due to the fact that there was only so many 1D cross sections and you, you only get a result of each 1D cross section and there were more 2D cells. And then there are just general differences because 2D and 1D aren't gonna give exactly the same answer. So uh, with the same end values, okay. And then here's an animation. This data set comes with the, the software also. It's our friend Baldigo Creek. There's a plan in there that has seven bridges in one plan. We're just gonna look at two of them. But here's a plan view looking at the results for a couple of bridges in that Baldy Creek data set. Here's one that's highly skewed. You can see the water going straight through and I'm colorizing this based on velocity. And then I got the velocity tracers turned on. You can see the flow patterns of the flow coming through the bridge, the eddy that forms to the right. And this one downstream, you can see the contraction of the flow through the bridge and the eddy that forms on the left-hand side and so forth. So, Again, remember these bridges can handle both low flow, pressure flow, pressure plus weir flow, complete overtopping, okay, uh, in 2D. So that's 2D bridges. Let's talk a little bit about wind forces. Uh, given that the time we have, I didn't, I'm not going to do much on wind forces other than say that we've added wind capability to both 1D and 2D. Uh, we have it in our 1D older finite difference capability, and we also have it in the new 1D finite volume capability, which I'm going to show in a minute. In 2D, you have to be using the full sink, but not equations, the shallow water equations. You cannot use diffusion wave. It wouldn't make sense to add wind to diffusion wave because you're already not including the acceleration terms. So that wouldn't make sense. So if you're going to use wind, you have to use one of the two new, two available shallow water equation solvers, full sink, but not equation type approach. Okay. Um, just like precipitation, if you're going to do wind, you can have both either gridded data, so you can have gridded wind forces, which is probably the best way to go, the most detailed. But if you don't have that, you can also have point data and it will interpolate, or you can enter data in tables. Maybe you just want to look at, well, a constant wind field for the whole thing and see what happens. Um, I'm not going to walk through how to do that. Again, um, in the uh, RAS 2D manual, there's a detailed description of that, as well as in um, the second video on the uh, RAS solution channel that we did a couple of weeks ago, if you want to look at that. I am going to show a couple of animations though. This is a recent hurricane event. This is Hurricane Laura that occurred this past year in 2020. And this first animation straight out of RAS Mapper is just the precip. So this is just showing precip colorized. Uh, obviously the, the darker colors, pink and reds are uh, higher intensity rainfalls in, in inches per hour. So there's the hurricane moving through. Okay. So that's the precip. Then here's an animation that's going to be the wind field. So before I start running it, this notice this uh, legend on the right. We've got very low winds like zero, this light green, and we're going to go up to dark red that's 180. This this wind field actually goes over 190, and it's about feet per second. So it was about 135, 140 miles per hour. It was a Cat 4 hurricane here, what we categorize them in the U.S. So here comes the hurricane wind field. And I'm going to move the mouse over so you can see there's 190 plus feet per second speed wind and in the center virtually zero. Okay, there's 195 feet per second. I'm turning on the velocity tracer. So even with the wind data, you can turn on the velocity tracers to see what the wind field looks like. And this is all just right in RAS Mapper. No special third party software or anything. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to look at is the resulting water surface. So here's the water surface elevation. And again, looking at the legend, the green is at zero ocean. If we went up to purple, that'd be 20 feet. This particular one gets over 15 feet. So we're gonna be in the reds to, to, to a little bit lighter color than red after that. So here's an animation of the uh, water surface based on that hurricane, what happened? And as we can see, we got the highest surge right at the, the coastline there and then moving in. When this is finished, now I'm going to hit the max water service. So this is a maximum water service that occurred regardless of time. And then I moved the mouse and you can see we got to about 15.3 feet for a max water service right there at the coast. Okay. All right, so that's winds. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the 1D finite volume solution. So I think mostly the stuff we've been working on is 2D, but um, our 1D unsteady flow solver is pretty old. And after we had our success with 2D, with the finite volume solution we use in 2D, 
we had the idea, you know, we should apply this same finite volume solution algorithm to Wendy. So we did that. And the benefit of doing that is you're now going to be able to start your channels completely dry and then wet and then go back to dry. So complete wetting and drying in 1D now, just like in 2D. Very stable, low flow modeling, which wasn't true of the previous finite difference solution solver. Can handle extremely rapidly rising hydrographs without going unstable. It does subcritical to supercritical and hydraulic jumps right out of the box. No need to turn on a special mix flow option like you have to do with our older solver. And then at junctions, it actually does a mini 2D solution for a single cell right at the junction, which we'll talk about here in a second. So a lot of benefits to this new 1D solution algorithm. So looking between cross sections, what it does is it breaks up the left overbank, the main channel on the right overbank into three finite volume cells. Now at each cross section, the water surface is still horizontal. So it's a 1D assumption of the water surface, but there's three different um, volume cells, okay, that water can transfer back and forth between. And the left overbank channel, right overbank, each have different lengths in calculating that volume. As I mentioned a minute ago, at junctions, what we're going to do is we're going to create a 2D cell. And we do that by connecting the ends of the cross sections. So your, your cross sections and your reaches have to be spatially correct and drawn correctly. And then it connects the ends of the cross sections and it forms a single 2D cell. And then the flow coming at the cross sections are the bounding faces of the cells. Flow can come in and out of those faces then. And it's going to solve actually the 2D equations for that junction cell even though it's doing a 1D solution. So at junctions, it does a single 2D cell. So here's gonna be a, an example. Our, again, our friend Bald Eagle Creek, um, and we're gonna start completely dry with Bald Eagle Creek, and then we're gonna bring in this hydrograph on the right. So it's gonna start at zero. It's gonna go up to 50,000 CFS and then back to zero. So here we go, starting dry. And here's the animation. There's the water going through. It's hitting the peak. Now it's coming back down. In the upper right, you're gonna notice it start to dry out here in a second, once we get back to zero flow. And no trouble whatsoever. So no trouble wetting it, no trouble drying out. Uh, really stable solution with this new one definite volume solver. Here's just a comparison for that same run, but starting with a base flow, because I'm gonna compare the one definite difference, which can't start dry or go dry, because it'll go unstable, uh, with the one definite volume for the same hydrograph, though with a base flow. So here we go. Okay, you don't see much there. It goes up and it goes down. In red, it was the finite volume, and in blue is the finite difference. But let's look at it from a hydrograph perspective. So the this left hydrograph that's in blue with the squares is the inflow at the upstream end. Then the um, pink hydrograph is the outflow at the very end of the river reach from the finite volume method. And the green dashed one is the outflow from the finite difference, the original 1D solver in RAS. The timing's about the same, peak is about the same. There are some differences though. Here, the one definite volume shows up a little sooner, so it's a little bit quicker on the rising side of the hydrograph, a little bit different shape, and then it falls a little faster on the falling side of the hydrograph. So not the same exact results. So that is something you need to be aware of. If you switch a model from one definite difference to one definite volume, you're not gonna get exactly the same results. You should get similar results, but not exactly the same. So if your model's calibrated, you may have to recalibrate your model to get as good as the results as you think you should be getting. So keep that in mind. Here's just an animation for a bridge. So you can see that it works through bridges also. And I'm showing both the I'm going to show both the one D finite difference and one D finite volume. The one D finite volume is the one with the uh, triangles and the one D finite difference is the solid line. So you're seeing there are differences even away from the bridge. There's some differences because it's really a different approach. Okay. Uh, where we're solving for water surfaces and in, in the cells, which are between the cross sections, uh, and only solving for momentum at the faces, which are the cross sections. And so that's very different than our previous 1D finite difference solver, which solves everything at the faces, water surface velocity, et cetera. Okay, I mentioned at the beginning, we've added a third 2D solver. So previous version, we had the diffusion wave and what we call the shallow water equations or solver. and our previous solver, um, on some instances, could have a little bit of numerical diffusion. And most of the time, if your cell size was small enough and time step was correct, it wasn't a, a problem at all. But if you're using larger cell sizes and larger time steps, then you started to get some numerical diffusion. So we thought, well, what the heck, let's add a third solver that's much more momentum conservative. So that's what we've done. And so 
uh, it's a more conservative discretization of the acceleration terms. And it, it's semi-explicit. So the one thing about that is it's going to require, in general, smaller time steps than our previous solver, which probably means it's also going to take longer to run. Um, but you get what you pay for, so to speak. So and it's just an option. Um, I'm going to show some examples. And where you're going to use this is on, on locations where you really are looking and want a tremendously detailed maybe velocity and water surface through maybe like a structure or a really sharp contraction or expansion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and maybe we're looking at some detailed analysis or even design. So here's a, a comparison. On the left is the original uh, full equation solver. That's what FEQ stands for, FEQ. And on the right is the new solver. And this is an instantaneous dam break. And this is actually a lab data set. So this black line is a wall of water at time zero. And then it's instantaneously, the gate is instantaneously released upward. It was actually on a spring to, to take it out of the water column. And then the orange squares are five seconds later, the yellow triangles are 10 seconds later, and then the red, I mean, the green circles are 20 seconds later. And then the solid lines are the computed results. So you can see the original full equation solver did quite well at the negative wave propping upstream, but the positive wave downstream, it was a little late. And so some of the velocity was being um, squashed a little bit uh, during this solution, okay? And so there was a little bit of numerical diffusion of the velocities. Um, so on the right though, same exact problem, but new solver, you can see at both five seconds, 10 seconds and 20 seconds, it's absolutely tracking perfectly the observed data and the, the leading edge of that, that floodway for this instantaneous dam break right on spot on. So the momentum is, is conserved um, much better here than it was here. Now, I will say that most of the time we don't do have dam breaks that are instantaneous dam breaks over a dry surface. You know, that's the kind of thing we do in lab studies and analytical cases. Uh, in real world dam break problems, our original solver works just fine because generally you're not, you don't have an instantaneous dam break. It occurs over some time, okay? And uh, generally there's water in the river system already. And so that was never really an issue for real world problems. It's more of these analytical solutions and lab cases that uh, people were talking about. So we decided to add a, a more detailed solver for that. This is just um, a mixed flow where we have a subcritical going to supercritical and then a hydraulic jump over a bump. The top is the older solver, the bottom is the new one. I would say both of these are good solutions to be honest because they both have the correct water service upstream and the correct water service downstream. But here the measured data, are actually it's an analytical solution is in orange and the model results in blue. And the older solver, you can see that it tracked quite well, went super critical, but the jump occurred a little sooner than the analytical solution said it should have, okay? Whereas with the new solver, it's still not perfect, but it tracks the, the going to super critical flow and down quite a bit further and then goes through the jump, okay? So slightly better result. But personally, from a, from a model application approach, both of these are good results, okay? Just the new one's a little bit better. And the last example I'm going to show is a sudden expansion. And here we've got water going from left to right through a narrower channel. And then it's going to expand to a wider channel right here at what we're going to call cross section zero. And then there's going to be other cross sections or plots of velocity at, at one meter, two meter, three meters, four meters, and five meters. And then this is showing the result from RAS in plan view with the velocity tracers turned on. And for this lab data set, the lab data showed that the flow expanded back to fully expanded at about 4.6 meters. And you can see RAS is, is, is able to do that. And it was able to do that with the current solver as well as the new solver uh, as, as far as getting this 4.6 meters correct, okay? So now what I'm gonna show is the velocity plots compared to the lab observed data. So the observed data is in squares, the, the model results are in red. On the left is the original full equation solver, on the right is the new solver. So at cross section zero, cross section zero, remember, is right before it expands, okay? And here we go, model and observe data right on, both in the old and the new. Then one meter downstream where it's starting to expand, the old solver started to lose a little bit of the high velocities. The observed velocities are a little bit higher than the model, but the general trend, very good. New solver showing, tracking those higher velocities better. If we go to two meters, 
Again, the old solver losing a little bit of the velocity, but not bad. This is still a good result at cross-section location two meters. New solver though, better, tracking those high velocities and also tracking the negative velocity. So what do I mean by the negative velocity? The negative velocity is down in here. So we have this recirculation pattern, positive velocity is from left to right, but negative velocity is from right to left. So at cross-section one and two and three, there's gonna, and four even, there's gonna be some negative velocity for that lower part of the recirculation zone. Looking at cross-section three meters, the old solver, losing a little bit of the high velocity and not tracking the negative velocity as well, whereas the new solver right on on the high velocity positive and very good on the negative velocity. Same thing true at cross section four and then five, okay. Um, new solver just does a better job. Now this result on the left, that's the original solver, that's actually a good solution. I've seen lots of 2D models that have run this data set have done worse than this, okay. But then the solution on the right is, is a bit better, okay. So the point is two solvers now, if you're really gonna want really detailed velocity distributions through tight contractions and expansions and structures, you might wanna try this new solver and give it a go. Computationally, it's gonna require smaller time steps, probably gonna take a little bit longer to compute, but maybe not, it depends on the data set. So try it out. But so now you have three uh, 2D solvers, diffusion wave, our original shallow water equation solver, and then our new one, okay. And you can read about those in the 2D uh, user's manual on that also. Okay, pump stations, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but we've added the ability, we've always had pump stations, but RAS hasn't had the ability to connect pump stations to 2D cells. So now you basically do that by entering X and Y coordinates for drawing in the pump where it goes from and to, and you connect from 2D cell to another 2D cell, from a 2D cell to a storage area, or from a 2D cell to a 1D river reach. Here's just an example where I have a pump station on the left. It has two pumps. One's pumping from this cell to this cross section. The other's pumping from this cell to that cross section, but that's one pump station with two pumps. And over here on the right is another pump station with one pump. It's pumping from a cell to a storage area, a 1D storage area. Here's an example where I've got a pump station and they're, they're, the black lines are the pump lines. Here I'm pumping from 2D cells down here to 2D cells up here. So all I'm doing is taking the water from here and pumping it up this hill and then releasing it and letting it run back down. So that was just an experiment. The pump data is the same. The only thing new is the X and Y coordinates of how you draw the pumps. So you actually have to draw the pump from where you want the water to go from to where you want the go to water to go to. It could be a straight line or it could be a multi-point line. It's up to you. So that's pumps for 2D. Let's talk a little bit about computational speed because 6.0 is quite a bit faster than 5.07. So if, I don't know how many of you tried out 6.0 yet, but just out of the box, you sure, your same data set is going to be quite a bit faster solved than, than 5.07. Well, how do we do that? Well, what, a couple of things we did. Um, RAS was previously using what we call a non-symmetric uh, matrix solver, but our mesh generation capability makes the metrics makes the matrix symmetric except for occasionally if a user messes around with a few points they can get a few cells that are slightly not symmetric but we decided that assuming that they were symmetric wasn't really that big of an error and so and since our mesh generation forces a metric the matrix to be uh, symmetric it's a pretty good assumption and by doing that switch we were able to, to switch to what's called a symmetric positive definite solver and with that assumption there's less math to do then and so if there's less math, it's gonna run faster. So the, the matrix solver is faster. In addition, we did further parallelization work in between time steps. There's a lot of things that happens um, as far as computing coefficients to set up the matrix, et cetera, et cetera. So we did some further parallelization work and, and the net result then is, here I've got a table of a bunch of data sets on the left, how many cells are in the data sets, whether it was the full St. Bernard equations or diffusion wave, and then how long did it take to run in 507 in hours, minutes, seconds versus 60? And then this is simply the, simply the speed factor. It's, it's the 507 time divided by the 60 time. And so data sets here vary from very small to some that are on 100,000. Here's one that's 162. And then here's one that's 2 million cells, okay? And then you can see the speed improvements. And if you average all of these, it's about 1.5. That means 60 for these data sets was 50% faster 
than 507 right out of the box with no changes to the data set whatsoever, just rerunning. However, another thing we did is we added some new matrix solvers. Our current solver in RAS 507 and 6L, the default solver is called a Pardiso direct solver. It's really a good solver for as far as stability and volume accounting, but it's not the fastest solver. There are some other solvers called iterative solvers, which have the potential to be faster, but they require some user-based tolerances, and those user-based tolerances we've set defaults for, but they potentially can have caused less stability, meaning if you have a model that's running but's going to the maximum iterations a lot, in other words, it's on the verge of instability, but it runs on the current version, if you turn on one of these iterative solvers, that might push it to over the top where it goes unstable. However, if you have a model that's running very stably and, and not really having a lot of iteration trouble, you switch to one of these iterative solvers, you're probably going to get a lot of speed improvement and get basically the same results. So I ran all those same data sets. So now here's 6.0 with the original Pardiso solver. Here's 6.0 with an iterative solver. And now here's the speed factor of 6.0 iterative solver versus 5.0.7. So some of these data sets like this one, um, this is an EU test 8A, which is a standard European data set test, 4.7 times faster, okay? Um, on average, twice as fast, okay? Several data sets in here more than twice as fast. A couple were slower. So the ones in red were actually slower than the 6.0, meaning the speed improvement was just 6.0 with Pardiso was greater than 6.0 with the iterative solver. So three of these, Actually, the iterative solvers were slower and the Pardiso solver was faster. Okay, last thing, 3D visualization. Um, as Ken mentioned, there's, you know, there's a lot of people on the RAS team and this is something that I've wanted for years and I've, I've seen other people do it in third-party packages with RAS results. I thought we, we should be able to do something right inside of RAS. So um, Anton, our youngest computer scientist, we put him to work on this and, and we're not done with this, but what we've got is quite quite cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and animate. So you, what you're gonna see is you can get um, an animation. Here I'm doing a breach through a levee inside of Bald Eagle Creek, okay? And then it's colorized based on velocity and you can turn on the velocity tracers, but every the terrain and the water surface is, is 3D. The other thing you can do is then you can fly through this. So here we are, we're gonna fly upstream. And you can predefine flight paths. So you can have a flight path already drawn and then have it just follow it, okay? You can plot different layers. Like here, I'm plotting velocity, but you can plot depth. You can plot water surface, okay? Um, you can turn on the velocity tracers, turn them off. And so right now, we have three-dimensional terrain and water surface and velocity, et cetera. And that's what's in 6.0. Where we hope to take this, obviously, is, is um, you know, buildings and three-dimensional structures and then draping over it, um, aerial photography, so it looks like the actual um, area that you're looking at. But it's kind of cool to look at stuff in 3D. Uh, it gives you another perspective of your model and the results of your model, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and let that play, but that's the end of my um, talk. And if there's any questions, we can maybe start into that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gary. Uh, first of all, that's awesome. Um, everybody's been so excited about these features. Um, th this is this is wonderful to see. And uh, again, just judging by the uh, 100 questions that have already come in that we've frantically been trying to answer. If everyone else wants to turn their cameras on, uh, we will highlight a few of those. Just to group a whole bunch all together, though, um, that uh, that we, in the interest of time, anything related to sediment join us for part two, please. Okay. So part two of this webinar will have the experts who wrote those models coming on to answer all of those questions. So we may not have hit those all uh, come in a couple of weeks time. I believe it's either the 10th or 11th of February, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but uh, it'll be in a few weeks time. Join us for that. We'll hear all about non-Newtonian flow. Uh, we'll hear all about the 2D, um, the, the additional 2D capabilities. And I also want to highlight that if you want to learn this and do this yourself, there are online resources. The YouTube videos are obviously free to walk through, but if you want that direct interaction, uh, sign up for some of the courses we've got. Um, in the Australian Water School, we keep ours pretty basic, so we'll walk you through a couple of workshops uh, on how to do this. Uh, we'll include these new features, um, but if you want to get into the guts of it, um, uh, Chris and uh, Ben have uh, an awesome set of courses coming up uh, in a couple of weeks' time as well, so uh, sign up for those courses. There are resources for you available to try this yourself and get that live interaction 
connection with uh, with the instructors. So um, over to I think let's let's go first to Mark and Chris. Uh, as you, I've I've watched your fingers typing here and seen these responses go in. Um, any that you want to highlight here and toss back to Gary and Cam uh, to to address. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Chris, and then over to Mark. Sure. Yeah. A um, lot of great questions. Uh, as Cray uh, mentioned, it was very hard to keep up with them, but I uh, appreciate all the interest here. And uh, so I tried to answer as many as I could, and I saw Mark was doing the same. And we even got some other participation by uh, some of the developers and others out there. But uh, one, uh, or there was a few of these questions, Gary, I'll throw to you, but um, your questions on uh, end values on 2D cell faces and when you might be able to vary those end values across a face, but also vertically uh, with varying depths of water. Sure. Um, we had hoped to get spatially varying end values across the face in this version, but it just didn't work out. So that'll be in a future version shortly. Uh, so that'll be next. And then vertically varying end values with depth will be after that. Okay. So that's okay. the, but those, um, we are, do have plans to do that. Um, just hasn't made it quite yet. <laughs> and uh, here's another good one that I'm particularly interested in. But what about gate rules in 2D areas? You know, currently they only work for cross sections. But what about uh, for 2D areas? No, you can do it in 2D too. We've added a new capability. Um, it's in in RAS. So in the geometry editor, there's a a, a new button at the top to. Um, I always forget the name of these. Um, they're basically like monitor points, okay, um, that you can add. And if you put those inside of 2D cells, then it'll monitor the water surface with time at those points. And then you can go have a structure in 2D and you can write rules for it. And then you can query at every time step, well, what's the water at this point? What's the water at this point? So you give those user-defined points names, okay? And then you can refer to those points and, and ask, well, what's the water surface right now there? And so then you can write rules against those water services. The next step is we're going to be adding the ability to, uh, from the rules, query the profile lines, which we don't have yet. But then you'll be able to query a profile line and say, well, what's the flow at this profile line? OK. You can query the boundary condition lines, though, currently. So like the inflow boundaries and the outflow boundaries, what's the flow there? What's the water service there in, in rules? So you can write rules for 2D structures and you can query 2D results, but right now it's water surfaces inside the 2D cells and then flow only at the boundary conditions um, and, and the structure itself. The, you can query the flow at the structure you're writing the rules for also. Great. Cool. Um, uh, Mark, anything uh, that, you, that you've highlighted? And uh, just before we go over to you, just introducing Marty Teal real quick, uh, who teaches our sediment transport courses um, and is very familiar to those on the call here. Um, just a uh, familiar face here to us. Um, he, if you'll, you'll see him if you want to sign up for the sediment transport courses as well. And he's been also answering questions on the chat line, as have I've seen some of the other members of your team, Gary, um, <laughs> have been answering questions as well. So thanks to everybody out there who's been answering them. Mark, anything stand out to you and thanks for the help marty um one of the questions that came up uh, gary was related to uh, bridges in in a tidally influenced area where your flow you may have flow reversal and how it handles yeah. that yeah no problem so the water can go in both directions through the 2d bridge just like in 1d and the same thing with the new 1d funded volume so you can have water you know if, you, if the tide's rising it'll go upstream if the tide's falling it'll go downstream so uh, it goes both ways okay now it does apply the curves that get generated in both directions. So one, one simplification is the curves are computed from downstream to upstream with those cross sections. So tailwater is considered downstream and headwater is upstream. It's not gonna recompute the curves, it just needs those same curves, but it's gonna use them in the other direction. Okay. So that is a, a bit of a simplification, but it's not too bad. Good. Um, anything else uh, jump out at you? Uh, well, we, we can just th throw a couple of them out there. But um, looking at the ones that have been upvoted the most, um, you know, gridded precipitation is something that everybody's looking for data sources on. Um, we'll we'll compile some resources. And one thing I want to point out to everybody who's an asking questions here is uh, we won't get to all of these uh, today, but we will have this list on hand, and we've got your contact details, and we can respond to you uh, directly uh, with with some resources and. Uh, 
and we'll, we'll paste a few links in here as well. So free for all, um, any, any comments, questions? We've got about 10 minutes to go here. What What's the other good one that I think uh, maybe Gary and Cray, you guys can both address, but a uh, question on where you get gridded precip data. The question was specifically about Australia, but um, what about uh, elsewhere? I'll leave it to you guys. Well, in the U.S., the obviously, we, we get we get gridded precipitation data mostly from the National Weather Service, and we can get it for free. Okay, and then there are commercial companies that also, to, you know, sell um, gridded products, um, which I'm not that up on, to be honest, since I don't generally pay for that data. So I don't know, Mark, do you have right. any? Mark, Mark um, actually, in from Australia, you've done some presentations and so you've teamed up with some people here. Um, you want to comment on that uh, for, for Australia? Um. Yeah, I'm not sure about exactly what data sources in Australia, but uh, gridded data sources can be generated from, from radar data as well. Um, and that's one of the things that our MET team does uh, is develop gauge adjusted radar rainfall data. Uh, one of the other questions that came in too was regarding the use of, of um, forecast data. So using a forecasted gridded data set from the National Weather Service is also an option of being able to, to forecast a, a, a future event. Um, and then observed events can be done from, from either the uh, uh, gauge adjusted radar product from the National Weather Service or it can be, uh, or it can be further re re um, refined through a, through a GAR process using somebody that's got those skill sets. Uh, Marty's uh, firm has, has a very skilled person as well, David Curtis, that does that as well. Um, one of the other questions that came in, Gary, that I, I think is, is worth hitting on is, is the uh, wind the wind influence, the wind, the flow, the, the wind field influence on the water surface and the ability to calculate wave runup, which is a very localized phenomenon on a, on a feature at the edge of your water body. Can you touch on that topic? Sure. Like if you have a, a reservoir that has a very long fetch, you know, and you get winds in the right direction, you can get quite a bit of wave runup. And you can do that in 2D. Um, you can do it in 1D too, but the 2D answer is going to be much better. Um, we added 1D because the Tennessee Valley Authority, who, who actually paid for this feature, thanks to them, uh, have a, has a lot of models of lakes that are 1D. But we very quickly said, hey, well, if we're going to do this, we want to add a wind in 2D also because it's going to be more accurate. And at some point, you're going to want to switch those 1D models to 2D models, and you're still going to want wind uh, capabilities. So, uh, but yeah, you can, you can do that on things like reservoirs and so forth and capture the, the wave run up if you have you know a refined enough grid and you apply the, the wind field so uh, so it's about like anything the more the water surface changes or the velocity changes you have to have the right grid cell levels to capture that right um, so RAS does have subgrid technology for the cells itself and the faces but you still only get one water surface per cell and one average velocity per face so if you think about it in that terms uh, and how detailed you want to get with the wave run up on a structure, then that will dictate what cell size you need and what kind of time steps you may need to run, depending upon the wind field and how it's changing. Cool. Sounds good. And I think one, you know, we've got about five minutes to go. We may hit a few other of these questions, but um, time frames. I, I know we don't like to commit to those, but that's one of the most upvoted questions, of course, is time frames for uh, the 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 full release. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we can't commit to that based on uh, some of the comments are still coming in on the beta testing period. Uh, but the yeah. and the and future versions, just kind of give us a, a, a layout of um, how many years in the future we're looking at uh, for some of the next versions and features coming up. Sure. So the, the beta test period is planned to be three months. Um, and But it always depends on um, how much feedback we're getting and how many bugs are coming in and how quickly we can get the bugs fixed. So. Um, but it for sure will be three months for sure. And then at that point, if we, we're not hearing from people and we're not getting any more feedback and we've fixed everything we know about, we'll make a release. However, if we're still getting a lot of feedback and we don't have all the bugs fixed, the beta test period will go longer. Okay. So we really do want to get it right as best as we can. Let's face it, though, there's no version of any software that ever goes out that doesn't have bugs, right? So the beta test period isn't going to go on forever. So, uh, you know, it's going to be three months for sure, maybe four months at the most, and it's going to be released is my bet. Don't hold me to that because I've been <laughs> wrong almost every time when it comes no, to no, no, no. estimating <laughs> releases. <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. 
And then after that, obviously, after 6.0 is released, there'll be some bug fix versions like 6.0.1, 6.0.2. There's going to be some um, new feature releases for things that we're already working on. There's a lot of stuff that we're already working on that's, that's not in 6.0. So there'll be a 6.1, possibly a 6.2. And then down the road, a couple of years or so, it's going to be a huge release. The next huge release is going to be RAS 7.0. And the biggest thing about RAS 7.0, a couple of huge things, is the main biggest thing, though, is a completely new user interface. So we've already been working on, we've already designed and have been developing a completely new user interface where we merge together the main RAS window, the geometry editor, and RAS mapper into one thing. So you won't have the geometry editor and RAS mapper as these separate spaces with graphical views. It'll be one graphical view, one place to view, edit, enter, layout, visualize one window, okay? There'll still be pop-up editors for things like bridge editors and cross-section editors and so forth, but RAS Mapper is a geometry editor and the, the main RAS window will be one thing in the new, new design. Uh, the other big thing is we're working with, uh, here in the US with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and they're, they're, we're doing quite a bit of work for them, both on uh, two, floodways in 2D, which is big here in the US, um, I think that's a big deal in, in Australia too, isn't it, Craig? Well, yeah, the floodways are computed differently, but um, yeah, we've got similar, but it, it's, right. it's hazard ratings and uh, awesome new scripting tools. Uh, we can share those, uh, you know, every jurisdiction, we can share those uh, amongst each right. other. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's been great. So depth times velocity type stuff for flood hazards and so forth, yeah. Um, the other thing that we're working on for FEMA is uh, a GPU sol solver. So we're rewriting another solver just specifically for another 2D solver specifically for the GPU. So at some point RAS will come out with a GPU solver which will, should be quite a bit faster than our current CPU solvers. So that's on the table also. So those are some of the big things. There's a lot of small things that I don't really have time to go into but those are the kind of the big things. All right. Well, I'm glad. I mean, it, it, we're having a version to play around with. I've been uh, drooling over this one. I, I first met Gary and Cam. They were nice enough uh, when I took a tour of the U.S. Um, actually, there's the HEC offices right about there. We drove past there a year or two back when traveling was still a thing, and they gave me a tour of the facilities there. Uh, their their um, their upscale facilities up, uh, up up above the shops, um, <laughs> and it was awesome. Um, and since that time, since I saw them demo these features, I've been uh, eagerly anticipating these and we've been trying uh, hoping to get them on for a, a live webinar like this uh, awesome thanks so much guys for coming on um, we're about at our closing time um, but um, any any parting thoughts uh, let's just have some some parting thoughts for just go through everybody um, Marty uh, we'll, we'll go backwards on my screen view from Marty to Chris and then Mark and then over to Cam and, uh, and Gary uh, that does be real quick. I, mean, I really want to congratulate Gary and Cam and Mark and the other uh, team members. I mean, this is fantastic. And and the number of people participating in, in these chats, as well as the ones that Chris had put on and things, it's just amazing. Uh, there's so much interest. So it's a, it's a great platform. Um, I will give a quick plug also for the, the next webinar again that Stanford Gibson and Alex Sanchez are going to do because there are a lot of questions about non-Newtonian flow in the Q&A, and uh, I know Stanford's planning on touching on that. So if you're interested in that, uh, uh, tune in. Uh, but uh, I think I'll stop there just in the interest of time. Yeah, sounds good. Chris, closing thoughts? No, thanks for having me on. Uh, great job, Gary and Cam, and uh, congrats to the entire RAS team. Uh, everyone is super excited about this new release and uh, super excited to try it out. And uh, just go to the RAS solution if you want to find more information, more detail, uh, the interview with Gary, uh, which, um, you know, goes into some other things as well as what he discussed today. And um, anyway, glad everybody could join in and thanks for having me. Yeah, sounds good, Mark. And just, just um, again, congrats to the, to the RAS team. Uh, these are new, these new features are going to be game changers in our industry, I believe. Uh, they give us the ability to do things we we couldn't do without at this level of detail before. So this is going to be exciting for us as practitioners to have these tools. Absolutely. And we very much appreciate your efforts. Great. Um, Cam, closing thoughts, uh, and then we'll have Gary uh, wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating. Um, we tried to get to all those questions, but... Um, <laughs> 
I know we didn't get to all of them, uh, but I was typing as fast as I could. And a lot of the times when I hit return, it wasn't on purpose. So they might be a little scattered. <laughs> so, Thanks sounds, for a good day, guys. Sounds good. Gary, closing thoughts? Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the Australian Water School for having us. I mean, uh, how often do you get to to talk on a forum like this? So it's it's a big deal to be able to, you know, tell about your work on a forum where you're touching people all across the world. And and so that's just phenomenal. So thank you so much for uh, having us. We really appreciate it. Uh, special, especially you, Cray. I know you really are, you know, go gangbusters down in Australia and really uh, do a lot of stuff with RAS and webinars and so forth. And so thanks for all your work too. And uh, thanks thanks to Chris Goodell and the Graz Solution. Also, Chris does a lot of posting and, and so forth. And that was fun doing the videos with you, Chris. And then of course, time, um, yeah. yeah, I gotta say thank you to the RAS team too, because uh, the reality of it is there's eight, eight of us on this team and we're all unique. We each have different skills and, you know, um, there's no way RAS can be built without a, a team of people. There's no way one or two people could build RAS, you know, so. The fact that we have eight people on the team, you know, just says a lot and they all work really hard. So, and I really appreciate their work. Sounds good. So well, thanks, Craig. Kudos to everybody. Um, it, there, this is, this is heck Raz, but you know, everything we're learning here, this is a wider community, the Australian water school webinars. Um, I recommend everybody watching uh, the two flow webinars. Um, the concepts are the same. They'll help you as a heck Raz modeler. They'll help you as a two flow modeler. Uh, they'll help you with all the other packages that you saw listed there. Um, you know, this is a global community that map says it all really um, that, that map, you know, thousands of people around the world tuning in just for this one. And then, there are other packages like this. We're all just trying to do the best we can in these uh, kind of tumultuous times, uh, get water where it needs to go, keep water away from where it might cause some harm. Um, let's do our best to further the, uh, the technology and the knowledge in the industry. One way you can do it is by signing up for these courses, which you'll see here. Um, stay in touch. Join us for our upcoming webinars. Uh, the, these, these are going to be a lot of fun, and uh, we, we look forward to further interactions with you. So thanks so much for tuning in to this extra long session we had, uh, but we wanted to uh, leave enough time to squeeze everything in um, and highlight everything. you got all the resources you need um, with, with courses and uh, videos out there. So let's, let's get to heck razzling. So with that, um, have a look at these screens, fill out the survey, and we're signing off. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.